Greetings and welcome to 303. Our project now for the hour is to be introduced to what we will call, and I hope that you're taking some notes now, the MLA style book. Let's talk really quickly about what this means. Let's talk about the issues of attribution to attribute. And of course, we use in 303 this language of external validation. Let's do it really quickly. Let's point out, first of all, that when we use the term style book, we just simply mean the rules of attribution. In other words, when you do research, you have to tell where that research came from. Okay? If you provide research in your writing without attribution, we call that plagiarism. Okay? So that's our academic definition of plagiarism. To plagiarize is simply to use another's words as your own, and therefore you have not told where it comes from. That's what we mean by attribution. To attribute means to say where it came from. All right? In the academic community, there's ostensibly two really popular style books. The first is what we call the MLA, Modern Language Association Style Book. Okay. Usually used mostly in the humanities. All right. That's your history, that's your English, stuff like that. And then the APA Style Book, the American Psychological Association. Remember, psychology spelled with a P. The APA Style Book, which is usually reserved for our math science instruction at the university college. Okay. In our work in 303, we focus on the MLA Style Book. All right. The APA Style Book you'll be asked to use when you are writing papers normally in the uh, science and the math departments at the universities where you attend. There's ostensibly three kinds of validation for 303. Let's just list them quickly. I know you already know this, but let's just get it fresh in our mind. Three kinds of validation. When you are writing, there's three ways that you can defend your thesis. Way one, your own opinion. You basically just give your own view. Way two, we specifically are assigned a text or texts that we call internal validation IV. Okay, and this is of course quoting that will happen either directly quoting with quotation marks or summarizing paraphrasing which we call indirect quoting and either way we have to attribute that by showing simply in the left hand margin with red ink this is where I'm quoting from the assigned text or text. So if I'm writing for example from Thoreau's Walden then obviously I'm quoting specifically from that text. The third kind of validation is what we're talking about now, what we are calling external validation to somehow differentiate it from internal validation. This is when you go and find outside sources beyond yourself or the assigned text. Okay? Now the way that that research is then going to be cited, that's an important word, C-I-T-E-D, the way that research is cited then has everything to do with the style book that we're about to introduce you to, the MLA style book. Okay. Now within your paper, there's basically two things you have to concern yourself with, and I'll just put two boxes up on the whiteboard here to help you understand this. We will talk about in-text citation, which means in the actual body of the paper itself, and then we'll talk about end notes or end text citation, okay? And this is your works cited page, okay? The idea is simple. You're going to do some research. You're going to need to quote that research or cite that research in the body of your paper, okay? Ms. Laird here in a moment is going to talk about the ways that gets done. Ostensibly, there's two ways that happens. One way is to include it in the narrative, so you're writing along and you use the author's last name actually in the narrative. The other way is to quote your material, and then at the end, in parenthetics, you're going to tell us where it came from. That is to say, author's last name normally, okay? We will never ever, in the body, in text, we'll never provide URLs, for example, of where we got information. No way, no how, okay? We're going to make sure that the information that we present here is not a distraction to the reader, namely a prop, all right? Then, of course, we're going to have a works cited page. This is going to be a listing then, at least five, almost always for us in our requirements, a listing of your sources in alphabetical order, last name first, with some other understandings, okay, in regards to how this is constructed. The idea is that this is, this is important. This is not a bibliography. We call it a works cited list for a very clear reason. A bibliography, you can look at materials and not cite from it and still list it on your bibliography. A works cited if it's listed here, it has to be quoted there. Simple. If it is listed on the Works Cited page, it must be cited or quoted in the body of your paper. Okay? Now, of course, 
The way that this is done in terms of the creation of a works cited page in the old days was to do it manually. You literally had to type in each piece of information. Today we have technologies that allow us to do this much faster. It helps us if we know how to use and manipulate those technologies. And you need to understand some of the limitations of those technologies, and that's where Ms. Laird is about to debrief you. However, just to remind you one last time, after you print your paper, this is not part of the MLA Stylebook. It's a way we check to make sure you're following the MLA Stylebook, and that's why we work with red ink. After you print your works cited page, you then are going to number your sources one through five with red ink in the left-hand margin. That's always the first thing you'll do. And then wherever source three is going to be cited in the body of the paper, you're going to write in the right-hand margin in text, capital E, capital V, number, and then three. That information then corresponds, all right? But again, we do that in red ink so that we demonstrate our understanding this is not the MLA style book. This is rather checking to make sure that the MLA style book has been followed. Do you understand? Okay. So in other words, you don't type number one before your citations on the works cited page. You do it with red ink okay, to make sure that we understand. There will come a point where in most of, our, in most of the classes in 303, there actually comes a point where we no longer have to do this because everybody understands the basic rules of the MLA style book, and we don't have to do it anymore. But for now, we do that to check. Again, just to remind, down the left-hand side, we're always identifying our internal validation EV. You do not have to identify your own personal opinions as the other form of uh, validation. All right? Now what we're going to do is we're going to turn to uh, Ms. Laird's presentation. She's got a, uh, she's got a, a PowerPoint presentation that you'll be following now. Okay. And that PowerPoint presentation will also be uploaded to YouTube and available on Learn Strong. There will be um, links that she has made for you that you can actually hit. She's going to talk to you a little bit about research uh, in the databases and then how we use this MLA style book. Ms. Laird, the floor is yours. Hi, guys. So I'm sure that some of you are familiar with using Noodle tools. Um, some of you may already know how to use the References tab in Word. I'm just going to review it for you and also give you another tool called EasyBib that will um, make it a little bit easier to do some of these online uh, citations. So first of all, you for MLA style when you guys get to university, this is what the top of your page is going to look like. You'll have your name, your teacher, your section, and the date. And if you'll notice, the date is written a little bit differently. It's the day, the month, the year. At the top of the page on the right is going to be the page number with your first name before it. And this will appear on every single page. This is just to make your stuff look a little bit more formal as you guys are moving up into these more advanced classes. You're going to start using this a little bit more. Make sure your title is centered at the login. When you guys are doing your research for a quote, do not use Google. I know it's really easy to do that, but when you use Google, you're going to find it hard to find legitimate sources. You're going they won't always have an author. Sometimes they won't have a date from when they were published. So we want you to use legitimate resources when you are doing your research. Our library has some wonderful research databases that you guys can access from the school website, which I have right here. And then I did a direct link to the student research that you can use. Um, it's called Go Wild. How many of you guys are familiar with using Go Wild for your research? Awesome. This is what you guys need to be using. Um, there are multiple research databases. One that I particularly like is Gale Literature. That one will have full books, uh, academic journals, articles that are really great for what you guys are going to be doing in here. Uh, for this purpose, I did, I used Gale, and one of the wonderful things about these research databases is they will have your citation information either at the top or the bottom of the page. You do not have to hunt down when it was published, who wrote it, 
what's the name of the article. It should be at the top or the bottom. And for this example, I was doing uh, a mock research paper on Macbeth. There are multiple ways that you guys can put your quotes in there. Never just put a quote in and leave it alone. You have to introduce your quote. You need to explain your quote. So for example, right here, there are many exa examples of how things are not what they seem in William Shakespeare's play Macbeth. In Paul Jorgensen's novel, William Shakespeare, The Tragedies, in his chapter titled Macbeth, he states, if it is the beginning of a sentence, you keep that capitalized. You can just copy and paste that into your paper. And then at the end, you can manually put in his last name. And if it's an article and you see the PDF, you can put the page number. If it's from a book, put the page number. No commas, period after the parenthetics. This is how you can manually do it. I did have an earlier link to, if you guys want to learn how to manually do MLA, to Purdue University, they have a wonderful uh, tutorial on there. Just remember the period goes after the parentheses. Now, if you want to use Word, they already have a tool available to you guys. At the top of Word, you'll see the References tab. Make sure that you are just before the period when you do this, otherwise it's just going to stick your citation in the middle of a sentence if your prompt is blinking there. So to go to the one in Word, you click on References. Next, you'll see right there in the References, Insert Citation. Click on Add a New Source. If you do this as you go along, it is building your Works Cited page as you go, so you don't have to do it at the very end. Once you're there, you're going to get a dialog box. Make sure that you click on Show All Bibliography Fields if you're using online research. They always want you to show the date that you viewed it. So you can select from books, journals, the internet, and so on. It will give you the option to put in the URL, but as you guys go on, some teachers want it, some don't. What they call the seventh edition of MLA does not require for you to put that huge long URL in there. They should be able to type in the title and the author and find the website themselves if they need to. This is what you guys are going to paste into your um, paper reader once you get done. So you'll have your dialog box, last name first, then first name, then middle initial. After that, you're going to get your title, the year, the pages, the city where it was published if it's a book, the publisher, and then down here is where you have the option for URL. You're going to have some teachers who still want you to enter that in, so you will have that option. But this is only going to show up if you click on Show All Bibliography Fields. Okay, and once you've entered that into the Word box, you hit OK, and it puts it in there for you, and you don't have to do it manually. You can move on to your next paragraph, your next citation. When you're getting ready to do your Works Cited page, I do not recommend that you do it in a separate document. Go ahead and keep it all in one. Just do a page break, which you can find at the Insert tab and then you will be ready to prepare your bibliography or your work cited. But like I said, it's a lot of times you can lose one document and not the other, or you don't have a backup. So I always recommend you just keep it all in one. When you're ready, when you have your blank page, you go back into References, you click on Bibliography, and you're going to look down here and click on Work Cited. And then when it's done, this is what it's going to look like. And on this one, I included that long, complicated URL. They want it to look a little bit cleaner now, so they're not, once again, including that. But you'll see how it does it for you. It moves over the bottom tab for the rest of the lines. And it will automatically alphabetize, you, alphabetize these for you as you go along. Another option is to use an online citation builder 
called EasyBib. It is free. Um, a lot of these databases, if you were to click on export citation, it'll give you the option to export it to something like EasyBib or EndNote or Word. So if you go ahead, you can create a free account if you want to save your works cited pages for a later date. You may want to use those same sources again for a different paper. So it's easybib.com, and the great thing about this is they have a bar where you just copy and paste that URL in, and it will build your citation. And unless there's some information missing, it'll put everything in there for you. It'll bring you to this dialog box, and it automatically did it for me. And as it's building my citation, you'll see what it's going to look like right here. So the more you do this, you'll be able to do it on your own without using something like this because it teaches you as you go. Now, if there is any missing information, you'll be right here, but you always need to have a title, an author, a date. These are very important things for legitimate citations, and you're not always going to find that on Google. Go ahead and create the citation, and then you'll have this where you can come back and edit it if you need to. If you look at it and you see that something looks a little funny, you'll notice that right here in the MLA citation it says web. That will tell whoever your reader is that you found that source off the internet. Now if it's a book, it'll say print. If it's a journal article, it'll say journal. And it'll alphabetize it for you when you're ready to go. You go ahead and hit export right here. Some of you guys use Google Docs. Some of you guys use OneDrive through um, like your Hotmail address or your online Word. It'll export to any one of those. For these purposes, we're just going to say print as a Word document. It'll bring you to another screen and download for Microsoft Word. And then you're going to just copy and paste that into your document. And this is what the one from EasyBib looks like. Not that much different. So those are two different ways uh, that you guys can build your MLA citations. And um, I think it's a little bit easier than using Noodle tools personally. And that's it. Okay, thank you, Ms. Laird. Let's finish now with a couple of final comments in regards to the whole issue of research. We want to be paying particular attention to the order of the research as we do it. Let's just say this out loud really quickly. One, always study our prompt. That's where we begin. We look at the prompt that's been assigned. We make sure that we feel comfortable with what we're being asked to do. Remember, we're always working with that A to B paradigm. A, what is the text or text that I'm being asked to work with? B, what are the ideas or the concepts that I'm relating either to that text or to some other idea? And with that in mind then, then we're ready to begin the process of our research. It's so vital that your outlining now as high school students becomes about your research. So in other words, while you're working with your outlining early on, you want to be asking about your own, of course, opinions, no doubt, but more particularly, what is the internal validation I'm going to be using to validate for this? And then, of course, what kind of external validation research is out there? The databases are the key. The reason why Ms. Laird says stay off of the open Google is because the open Google is made to make money. That's what it's there for. So the majority of the intel that you're going to get there early on is going to probably take you to places and websites where people are trying to sell you stuff. Also, we don't have the online kind of scrutiny of those sites that we have on our databases or, of course, on Google Scholar. If you're at all interested in using Google as your primary search engine, make sure you write down Google Scholar. You can, you can uh, search for Google Scholar. That will give you then academic research that you can then utilize. However, Gail and other places that Ms. Laird is suggesting to you, far superior. We for sure want to stay away from the sites that are our quote sites and that kind of thing. That is not research. We don't go to quote sites to find research to, to get our external validation research. Rather, we go to actual research and we read the documented research there and then we cite that. Okay. Now, having said that, if you find a quote that you like on a quote site, just find it then in the databases in the actual 
you know, uh, um, primary source. I, you know what I'm saying? So, like, you, you like the Gandhi quote, but you're not going to reference the Gandhi quote to the quote site, but rather you're going to actually find where Gandhi said that in some kind of primary source. Does that make sense? So, in other words, that's how you can kind of learn to use then some of the technologies that are out there to help you. We never quote from Spark Notes or from Monarch Notes or from Cliff Notes. We don't do that kind of, or that kind of citation work at all. That's not to say you can't look at it. It's just that you don't cite it. You can look at lots and lots of online papers that have been written on the topic of your choice. Two things about that. One, obviously you don't want to borrow any of that information. You do not want to use that paper as your own. However, if the paper has been written with a reference page, a works cited page, that's a great way to start running down your own citations. In other words, one good research paper can help you write a research paper or do some research. So in other words, use all of the things available to you online, but I would say you're going to have to be intelligent with the way you use that information. All right? Finally, it makes a whole lot of sense that as you're getting ready to improve in this area, that you are looking at each other's writing that you really are paying attention to the way that the citation is being used. Especially going forward, look at how other students are doing it. So reading each other's papers now becomes not so much just about finding grammatical errors, but rather looking at the way that they're doing their research. Our goal, of course, is to improve our attribution process. For example, instead of saying over and over again the same verb to set up your quote, so-and-so says, so-and-so says, so-and-so so says, start working with attribution verbs that make uh, your writing sound a little bit more erudite. So-and-so reports, so-and-so suggests, so-and-so implies. Do you see what we're saying? And that can allow for your writing then to not be so kind of, uh, you know, cookie cutter sounding. Does that make sense? Comments, concerns? Thank you. Best of luck with your research.